Hi everybody, my name is Richard Santoro, and I welcome you to Third and Zen, the YouTube channel where every week we are sharing a spiritual message to nourish ourselves, heart, mind, body, and soul. First, thank you for stopping by the channel, checking out the video. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're enjoying the earliness of spring, the leaves and everything starting to bud, the allergy season, all of it. But I hope you're doing well with everything going on in your life and everything going on in the world around us. I hope you're stopping, taking the time to care for yourself, care for one another. And again, thank you for checking out the video. If you like liking, subscribing, sharing, all that good stuff, that'd be great. Either way, thank you for you. Okay, let's get into today. Let's get in to what we are going to do today. There we go. Nice and slow, less tongue twistery. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read a passage from the Gospel of Luke. We're going to read the story of the Good Samaritan. We're going to read a little bit before. Um, so we're going to read that, then we're going to talk about it, and we're going to talk about it, and we're going to talk about it. Okay, so if you want to take a deep breath, get yourself situated, get yourself ready, we're going to jump right into it because I have a lot to say today. So um, I will put the exact chapter and verses and everything, but this is a monumental chapter. It's in chapter 10, the Gospel according to Luke. So... Deep breath, and let's hear what the author has to say. There was a scholar of the law who stood up to test Jesus and said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? The man said in reply, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus replied to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But because he wished to justify himself, the man said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man fell victim to robbers as he went down from Jericho, I'm sorry, from Jerusalem to Jericho. They stripped him and beat him and went off leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the road, but when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. Likewise, a Levite came to the place, and when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. But a Samaritan traveler who came upon him was moved with compassion at the sight. He approached the victim, poured oil and wine over his wounds, and bandaged them. Then he lifted him up on his own animal, took him to an inn, and cared for him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper with the instruction, Take care of him. If you spend more than what I have given you, I shall repay you on my way back. Which of these three, in your opinion, was neighbor to the robber's victim. The man answered, the one who treated him with mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This ends the reading. So let's talk about this. Let's first give this scripture passage some very brief context, and then we'll really get into things. Because you see, with this story, the monumental story of the Good Samaritan, we, and I mean we in a very general way, tend to see this story as being about just being a helper, be a Good Samaritan. But it's a lot more than that. So just a quick, brief recap so that we're all on the same page. First, Jesus is asked about what is the greatest commandment. And Jesus says, in part, to love your neighbor. Just focusing on that. And then there's a follow-up question. All right, well, then who is my neighbor? And Jesus answers that question with the parable of the Good Samaritan, pointing out this is who your neighbor is. And this is how you should love said neighbor with the example of the Samaritan. Make sense? Okay, great. That's the full context. Now, let's really get into today's message, shall we? Let's briefly flush out the story a little bit more and give a little bit more context of what the Samaritan did. And let's examine briefly the attributes of the Samaritan, the actions, the inactions, all that. So we're going to break down, break down, go a little more. And I promise you, there'll be, a, there'll be fruit here that'll be had. 
So this good Samaritan, this individual, this Samaritan, this helper, he helped when others would not. He helped without question. He helped without judgments. He helped without knowing a single thing about the person who was a victim on the side of the road. A single detail about who they were or what they were all about. But rather, he helped because the person was a victim, because the person needed help. He helped without expectations or thinking about any kind of repayment at all. He was very, very generous in his help, not only giving of his time and energy and efforts, but he went above and beyond in helping. He allowed himself to be inconvenienced and put out without complaint. He helped because it was needed and because he could, period. This is who Jesus gives us here. And the question I have for all of us today is, do we love our neighbor in this way? Do we love our neighbor in this way? This way that Jesus directs. Without question or judgments, without caring what category or label or box a person fits into, without our arbitrary barometer of their worthiness, simply because they need help, period. Because they are a victim without expectations of repayment, without complaint, because people need help, period. Is this us? Now, let's, let's look a little deeper. Let's dig a little deeper. Again, who is our neighbor? Well, according to Jesus and the parable of the Good Samaritan, just to make sure we're all on the same page here, our neighbor is whoever is in need. Whoever needs help, whoever is a victim of anything, period. Our arbitrary criteria is taken out of the equation for us by Jesus. Now, let's really get into it. Us, today, society right now, with the love our neighbor and good Samaritan context of Jesus... Who is our neighbor right now? Who needs our help right now? Who is a victim today, a la the parable of the Good Samaritan? Who are we walking past, like the priest and the Levite of the story? Who are we encountering who needs help, like the Samaritan? And are we helping are we protecting them? Well, let's see. Let's run down a list of who needs our help today. Our neighbors are, for starters, LGBTQIA people, for one. Specifically, transgender people at the moment. But all people who are ostracized or discriminated against or worse than that, because of their sexual identity or their gender identity and such. Also, immigrants, refugees, people fleeing one place and looking for safety in another place. Legal, illegal, doesn't matter. Makes no difference when looked at through the lens of Jesus. Let's keep going. The poor, the hungry, the homeless, those living in less than ideal situations, the jobless or the overworked, the underpaid and the exploited, those with addiction issues, all of the above whom find a society that won't listen or help or care for them properly. Let's keep going. People struggling with their health, specifically with their mental health and can't get help, or find it next to impossible to get help, and find a society that won't listen or help 
or care for them properly. People struggling with their physical health and can't get help or find it next to impossible to help, to get help. And find a society that won't listen or help or care for them properly. Let's keep going. The neurodivergent, the differently abled, those with special needs and find a society that won't listen or help or care for them and protect them properly. Let's keep going. The victims of abuse, child abuse, elder abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, victims of domestic violence, victims of sexual assault and or sexual harassment. All of the above whom find a society that won't listen or help or care for them and protect them properly. Let's keep going. Victims of police abuse. Victims of systemic abuse. Victims of an unjust justice system. All of whom find a society that won't listen or help or care for them and protect them properly. Let's keep going. We're almost done with this list, but let's keep going. Victims of bigotry and discrimination. Victims of ethnic or religious bigotry and discrimination. Victims of racism. Victims of sexism and misogyny. Victims of gender discrimination, oppression, or inequality. Victims of ageism. Victims of economic abuse. Victims of economic discrimination, oppression, or inequality. Victims of social oppression or inequality. All of the above who find a society that won't listen or help or care for them or protect them properly. My friends, these are all... All of these are our neighbors. All are on the side of the road. All victims in some way needing our help. Let me say that again. These are all our neighbors. All on the side of the road. All victims in some way. All needing our help and our protection. They are victimized. They are the outcast the disregarded, the picked on, the bullied. They are the different, the other. They are the one in need. They are the victim, just like in the story that Jesus gives us to answer the question, who is our neighbor? For us to actively love. Are we treating these people, all of these people as our neighbor, as Jesus would want with active love and care and comfort and protection? What are our actions towards these people? Are we ignoring Jesus and rather judging first and using our gauge of worthiness? Or even worse, are we one of the ones who are actually victimizing these people and leaving them on the side of the road? Are we making fun of them or picking on them, belittling them, diminishing them, ostracizing them, or in some direct or indirect way supporting the harm that comes to them? And what about our inactions? Are we walking on by, just passing them like the priest or the Levite, with an air of apathy or even judgment? Are we not attempting to understand them and their plight in a loving way? Are we not protecting them? Are we not helping them? Again, our inaction. Are we just walking by? Think of that list again. It was a lengthy list. Think of all those people. Are we making criteria Benchmarks, conditions, requirements, excuses, labels, legalese, and laws that we are so devoted to above all else before we even consider helping them or as reasons why we won't help them at all. Or worse, 
as reasons why we ourselves are cruel or discriminatory in some way. My friends, if so, that is not of God, of Jesus, of Scripture. That is not in line with this or any teaching model or example of Jesus. I require mercy, not sacrifice. Love your neighbor. Are we allowing others to legislate and govern as a way of ignorance or harm or cruelty? That sure is happening a lot these days. A lot. Do we just walk on by allowing it? Are we allowing others to victimize? Are we allowing cruelty? Again, that sure is happening a lot these days. A lot. Bringing us back to the scripture and back to Jesus and back to his direction. Are we living the Good Samaritan way of life, as Jesus prescribed. Love our neighbor. And who is our neighbor? Again, look at the story that Jesus lays out. It's simple. It's the person in need, the victim, the person who needs help, period. We don't need to know the details of someone's life situation in order for them to get welfare or financial assistance or housing assistance help from the larger community. The Good Samaritan didn't inquire or judge before taking from his coin purse to help a person in need. We don't need to know how someone came to this country fleeing something and seeking better and safer. The Good Samaritan didn't inquire the legalese or the nationality or status or citizenship or question why this individual was on such a notoriously dangerous road of travel before tending to the person in need and seeing them and caring for them to the fullest. We don't need our lived-in experience or lack of lived experience in so many areas and paths that others live and walk to dictate how receptive we are in believing and helping those who beg us to recognize and help with discriminatory and oppressive systemic issues in so many walks of life for so many people. The Good Samaritan didn't stop and question whether this person was who was victimized, had an experience that they understood or agreed with on a veracity level. They just helped. When viewed through the lens of Jesus and the greatest commandment of loving our neighbor and answering who is our neighbor via the story of the Good Samaritan, we just need to help all these people, period. We don't need to understand the science of being transgender or any of the part of that big umbrella of LGBTQIA, what it all means, all the complexities and nuance and science involved. We just need to know that in so many ways, these people are indeed victims. They are people. They are our neighbors who need our help and our care and our protection. We don't need to understand the very complex and nuanced science behind transgender or gender identity or the brain wiring for biological sex or gender expression or sexual orientation or cisgender or gender, gender neutral, all of it are helping and caring for them as human beings and our neighbor and protecting them is not predicated upon our understanding of any of it or all of it. When viewed through the lens of Jesus and the greatest commandment of loving our neighbor and answering who is our neighbor via the story of the Good Samaritan, or really any healthy, thoughtful, healthy, and wise moral code, 
We just need to help and care for and protect these people, period. Our understanding, again, and I can't say this more emphatically from the model and teachings of Jesus, our understanding of what it at all means to be transgender or any of it is in no way, shape, or form necessary or prerequisite or requirement for us to be kind and to be a help and to protect and for us not to be judgmental or cruel. Please look at the story, look at the Gospels, and tell me if I'm wrong. Bottom line, when it comes to this very present issue of transgender people, we don't need to understand it to not be jerks or worse. My goodness, people are so cruel lately with all of this unnecessary and genuinely baseless legislation and the vitriol and verbal poison and the ugliness that I see and read and hear towards transgender folks lately, so cruel and heartless and unkind, so unchristlike, and from Christians, Especially lately, the ridicule, the ugly jokes, followed by the gaslighting of it, it's just jokes. And the actual treatment, the social treatment, the legislation, the conversations, it's downright abhorrent and ugly and shameful and unchristlike. It's like folks, good folks, good people who profess to be Christians just want to be some version of Christian that celebrates on Sundays, celebrates one Easter Sunday, celebrates a couple of times, celebrates and sings hymns on Sundays and worships and says, look at me, I'm a Christian. And then not long after, turns around and treats the victim and the oppressed like garbage, like crap, like not human whether it's transgender people or immigrants or any of the victimized folks that I mentioned earlier. And all while not even attempting to come close to embracing or living the teachings of Jesus, particularly this teaching, to love your neighbor and the story of the Good Samaritan. Please, my friends, forgive the strong tone, please. But it just... It breaks my heart. It really does. Seeing how ugly people can be towards the outcast, the marginalized, the victimized, the ones who need help the most, any of them. And when, when we do nothing about it, when we say nothing, we become the priest and the Levite of the story, just walking by, not caring, ignoring, doing nothing. When did people become so non-disposed to sympathy? I had a list of suicide rates and suicide attempted rates and other horrible society-induced, community-induced, family-induced, lack of mental health-induced rates, statistics, and data for transgender LDB, LGBTQIA, and for some of the other folks that I mentioned earlier, for us to know, for us to get an idea, for us to understand, for us to see, to see these people need help, to see these folks through the lens of Jesus and the Good Samaritan. But I know that I've said a great deal already, and I'll just encourage, I'll just encourage all of us to look for ourselves, to see for ourselves. Make the effort. Don't just walk by. It's a valuable journey to take. I promise you to look for the need for love and care and protection first and foremost for the immigrant, the refugee, the addicted, the mental health struggling individual, the abused, the bigotry and discrimination victim, any of them, all of them, Look at our neighbor. See them. 
look at and explore all things and all people through the lens of Jesus. Please make the effort. And let's, let's, let's be crystal clear about something. I am not trying to place my worldview on anything. I'm not looking at all of this or any of this. I'm sorry, scratch that. I'm looking at all of this through the lens of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus, his teachings, his views, his example. You can disagree with anything you want. You can feel anyone is unworthy of help or protection. You can have a different set of morality on all of this. But then the question does become, do your views and your moral compass on loving your neighbor align with those of Jesus? Because that's where I'm coming from with all of this. That's the gauge. This isn't worldviews. This isn't CNN, Fox, liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican. This is the gospel of Jesus. And not Jesus the Americanized, the Jesus whom some have fashioned into their own likeness, but Jesus of the Gospels. And I just want to add this. It's worth noting that Jesus specifically chose to address this, and the Gospel writers chose to share it. The idea of loving our neighbor and clarifying exactly who our neighbor is. Jesus saw the same problem in his day that we have in our day. The Jewish people were being way too nationalistic and not helping certain other people. They were not recognizing non-Jewish people as their neighbor worthy of love. And they were looking to laws and legalese to put folks into a box of unworthiness. All of this very much existed in Jesus' day, which is why he addressed it. To Jesus, the problem wasn't the poor not pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. To Jesus, the problem wasn't the law following some set of statutes. I'm sorry, to Jesus, the problem wasn't following the law following some set of statutes or legalese deeming someone's worth or worthiness of help or not. To Jesus, the problem wasn't one of nationalistic, rigid lines of citizen, non-citizen. To Jesus, the problem wasn't someone's conformity to a preset societal standard of who they should be. To Jesus, the problem was a lack of love, a lack of care, and a lack of compassion from people towards those who needed it. To Jesus, the problem was a lack of people recognizing that any person in need is a person worthy of love and care and protection, plain and simple. The gospel writers didn't share anything about Jesus ever saying anything or having a problem with gay people, poor people, old people, young people, homeless people, people begging for help, people of other faith traditions or cultures, foreigners, refugees, immigrants, legal or illegal, or any victims. Nowhere in the Gospels does he criticize, judge, demonize, derogatorily label, or blame victims for their plight or their situation. He wanted to help these people, and he did help them, and he actively, actively loved them, and he wanted them to be helped by everyone. But he does call out, what he does call out are people unwilling to help them. He calls it out all the time. People, leaders, attitudes, words, actions, inactions, laws, Laws and, laws and legislation, institutions, systems. He calls them out all the time. All the time. And second to the topic of love, what he taught about and spoke about the most was judging others, or rather, not judging others. 
He calls that out all the time. All the time. So yeah, Jesus had the same issues in his time as we have right now. We would be wise to examine for ourselves what Jesus called out and what he didn't call out to ensure that we are landing on his side of things. Rather than allowing our hubris, ignorance, arrogance, judginess, or the misguided moral compass of ourselves or others to place us on a side that isn't Jesus' side, the side that isn't loving our neighbor. And before we close today, also of note briefly, briefly, Jesus loved the Jewish people. Jesus loved Israel. It was duly noted in the Gospels just because he criticized certain Jewish behaviors, laws, leaders, systems, didn't mean he didn't love Israel. Likewise, we are allowed to be socially critical and call out injustice. Jesus criticized the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the nation of Israel, the religious, social, political, and cultural leaders and institutions of the time, but he also didn't treat it all as one terrible monolith. Again, he loved the nation of Israel, and he welcomed Pharisees into his life. He simply begged them to get it together and get on track. We are also allowed to call out leaders, institutions, and systems like Jesus did, without being told that we hate the police or we hate our country and so on. And Jesus fully examined the history of Israel, honestly and openly, warts and all. Likewise, like Jesus, we would be wise to honestly and openly and sincerely examine and encourage examining our country and society's history, warts and all. Anything else would honestly be head in the sand, insincere, and dishonest, a dishonest examination of our honest history and not be a path to being better at loving our neighbors and loving those in need. To close us out here today, the other. We label as the other and then we make reasons to not help, love, protect. We make excuses. We set bars. We place conditions. You know, there's a reason why Jesus centered this story on a Samaritan person as a helper. Samaritans were from the Jewish family tree, once part of the great big tribe. But in Jesus' time, they were now seen as enemies of the Jewish people, who felt that they, the Jewish nation, were themselves God's true chosen people. The Jewish people and leaders and laws saw Samaritans as lesser than, unworthy, dirty, unclean, illegal, not right, not how it should be, worthy of ridicule, mocking, worthy of being looked down upon, not to be associated with, not to be helped or protected. They were seen and treated very much as the other. And this, this is the one that Jesus made the loving example of. The one who loved their neighbor as Jesus wants us to. This is the one whom is called good. Not the priest, not the Levite, the Samaritan, the so-called other. That is not by accident. There is a reason why Jesus placed the priest as a passerby who didn't help. They were the religion, the representatives and servants of God, but they didn't help. There's a reason why Jesus placed the Levite as a passerby who didn't help. They were the religious and morally upright person, the good Jewish person, the right person, 
the legal person in the view of the law. But they didn't help. There's a reason why Jesus placed the Samaritan, the other, as the one who helps. The one who properly performs the Hebrew teachings to love one's neighbor. The Jewish leader, I'm sorry, the Jewish people, culture, and leaders put up literal and figurative walls and barriers and laws and conditions and attitudes and judgments when it came to who they deemed were their neighbors and worthy of love, worthy of their help and care, and worthy of being worthy, period. And in the process of clarifying things, Jesus was calling that out. We, as regular individuals or as Christians, as a culture or as a society or as a nation, all too often, way too often, do what Jesus is calling out, don't we? Jesus gave the people of his time and the people of our time a story and teaching to course correct and let us know who our neighbor is and how they should be treated. Boy, do we need it now as much as any time that I can remember, and that is saying something. And again, one last reminder. Who is our neighbor, according to Jesus? I'm going to look to the Robin Wright movie. Robin Wright, the beloved actor, star of the classic movie, The Princess Bride. She made her directorial debut, uh, a movie in 2021, a wonderful film called The Land. I highly recommend it. And with no spoilers, let me reference that. Who is our neighbor, according to Jesus? In this movie, one person helps another person. And that person asks them, why did you help me? And the person responds simply, you were in my path. You were in my path. It's that simple. According to Jesus, we are to love our neighbor. And who is our neighbor? Anyone and everyone in need. Everyone in our path. Love them actively. Always be kind to your fellow human being. No conditions, period. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you so much for stopping by, for checking out today's message. If you stayed with us throughout the whole video, thank you. Thank you for being here. If you feel like liking the video, subscribing to the channel, sharing this video, that does help get word out. Either way, I want to wish you love and peace on your journey, every path that you take. I pray that you go with God that you go with the light of God's countenance upon you, filling you with joy, with hope, with healing, with comfort, with protection, with all that you need today, right now, and going forward. God bless you all. I love you. Thank you. Have a great day. Ciao.